Thanks for joining us for the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. We're excited to have Dr. Kate Kruger as the guest for today's episode. Most people learn about podcasts from their friends, so please share the link with any friends or colleagues that you think might find this show interesting. Seeds and Chips is taking place on May 6th through 9th in Milan, Italy. Cultured Meat and Future Food podcast guests Benjamin Bolog and Thomas King will be speaking at the event. Learn more and register at www.seedsandchips.com. The New Harvest 2019 conference is taking place on July 19th and 20th at the MIT Media Lab. Register today at www.new-harvest.org. We'll be hearing more about the event and New Harvest on this episode. The Cultured Meat Symposium is taking place on November 14th and 15th, 2019. Learn more and register for the Cultured Meat Symposium at www.cms19.com. This episode was recorded on March 21st, 2019. Kate Kruger is Research Director at New Harvest, where she leads new initiatives in cellular agriculture. Prior to New Harvest, Kate worked as a scientist at Perfect Day Foods, formerly Move Free, a cellular agriculture startup where she contributed to Perfect Day's Cell Ag Protein patent. Kate holds a PhD in cell biology from Yale and is passionate about using tech for the betterment of society. Kate, I'm excited to welcome you to the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. Kate, tell us a little bit about your background and your role at New Harvest. I'm a protein biochemist by training. I kind of came up through a pretty standard academic background, undergrad degree in biochem, PhD in cell biology with a real emphasis on biochemistry and, and focus on proteins particularly. So I worked at Perfect Day Foods in uh, California for a bit, working on protein purification. And following my PhD, I joined New Harvest as research director. At New Harvest, I run our research operations. So that's our fellowship program, our seed grant program, our exploratory projects. And I work with a lot of people to kind of help us position cellular agriculture so we can get as much funding as possible from government and other sources. When we think about cellular agriculture, specifically cellular agriculture research, there are several products or end results of cellular agriculture that come to mind. Can you tell us a little bit about these different types of uh, cellular agriculture projects and really the, the major difference between cellular agriculture technologies? Yeah, definitely. So I think the two main types of cellular agriculture that people talk about a lot are cellular agriculture and acellular agriculture. So a cellular agriculture is the use of actual cell cultures for food production, usually coupled with something like a scaffolding material that the cells grow on. But the idea is that the food that people would be eating is actually muscle cells that were derived from an animal and grown in culture outside that animal. So the idea is that if you're eating a cultured burger, you should be eating the actual cells from a cow or from a pig. Acellular agriculture is a rather different idea, and that's the idea that you can stick particular genetic sequences from one species into another to make a certain protein that you're interested in. So it's like the idea of sticking the genetic material for a milk protein into a yeast organism so that yeast can produce a lot of milk protein. So the difference there is instead of having a whole cell in the actual product, what you'd have is a protein product that's identical to that of a different organism. So when we're talking about perfect day foods, that falls into the acellular category. Yes. If I were to ask, could we do that acellular method to create meat products or not? Yeah, it depends what kind of meat products you're talking about. So I think a lot of people would say that maybe that wouldn't be a uh, cultured burger in the traditional way that we kind of think about it at New Harvest. But I think a good example of this, and I'm going to go out on, on a limb here because I know Impossible Foods doesn't consider their burger cellular agriculture, which is completely fair. They do have a plant-based product. But that method that they use to add hemoglobin to burgers, I think could be termed acellular agriculture if people were interested in calling it that. Interesting. Okay. So we could technically, I'll, I'll use the word maybe, call the Impossible Burger an acellular agriculture product. 
I think so. It's it's a little bit. It's all semantics. So right, I think right. I think it's definitely uh, perfectly fair billing as plant based as well because I think a lot of acellular agriculture products are usually adding some high value component to a plant based base, uh, and that just has to do with how expensive it is to make these additional products. So that's that's the idea though. From a scientific perspective, uh, what are some of the research projects that New Harvest is currently funding? Yeah, so New Harvest is funding a lot of projects I'm really excited about. One new one that we're bringing on is with Dr. Amy Rowett at UCLA working on cultured meat marbling. So how we get fat integrated into tissues with muscle. So that's something I'm really excited about that's kind of brand new in our in our research portfolio. Another project we're adding is a project led by Dr. Laura Domigan at University of Auckland working on media formulations uh, with her graduate student uh, Kai Steinmetz. So we're very excited about that project as well. We've got a couple projects in the UK that I'm really excited about for bioreactor formation. Scott Allen's our grad student there working with Dr. Marianne Ellis. And we're hopefully bringing on another project in the Bath area soon. So I'm very, very excited about all these kind of new projects in the works. Great. And I know that there's there's quite a lot of activity happening around that part of, of the UK. Um, so that that's really exciting. Uh, I want to kind of jump back into what you mentioned about cultured meat marbling and something that you mentioned a little bit earlier regarding scaffolding. Um, can you tell us a little bit about scaffolding from a high level? Can you tell us a little bit about it? And when I think of scaffolding, I am thinking of the Aleph Farms steak and that the research that was conducted in the Levenberg lab, uh, I think attributed to a lot of the progress that happened at LF Farms. Tell us maybe a little bit of a high level of where scaffolding has come in relation to cultured meat. Yeah, definitely. So as for the LF Farms example, I'm not so familiar with that company and their work, so I really can't comment on that particularly. But scaffolding is a really key component of any cellular cellular agriculture product. And the reason for that is because once you start growing one muscle cell on top of another, eventually you hit the point where these cells don't get enough oxygen and they begin to die. And to get around that kind of fact, what people need to do is they need to have a material that these cells can grow on that can be perfused with media, the food for cells, so that cells can get oxygen and nutrients even when they're growing in these larger 3D configurations. So there are a lot of scaffolding materials that are available. We're really lucky in that biomedical science has done a lot of kind of work in this area for us already that we're able to piggyback off of. So there are a lot of scaffolds that are pretty established in the tissue engineering space, including things like silk, which is edible, but maybe maybe not an ideal target for a couple of reasons since it's a little more expensive and also animal derived. But there are a lot of various materials that can help these cells to grow and to migrate in such a way that they can uh, grow in these larger chunks than we'd be able to have otherwise. So we could actually get a cultured steak or a cultured filet of fish, for instance. So some materials that people have been using recently that are pretty exciting are things like decellularized plants. So you can actually remove all the cell material from a plant, such as a um, piece of celery, for instance, and grow cells on top of that. And the great thing is that leaves you that the cellular scaffold is pretty inexpensive and pretty ordered. So the cells just grow on it pretty well. So that's one example of a low cost scaffold that could show up in a food source in the future. Another one is called chitazan, which is something that either is a byproduct of the crustacean industry or is mushroom derived. And it turns out that insect cells just really like growing on chitazan. So that's a possibility for either crustacean cellular agriculture or for uh, insect cellular agriculture as well. That is really interesting. I have a question about insect cellular agriculture, but I'll get to that in a second. A couple things that I thought of from what you were saying is scaffolding technologies, you said, come primarily from medical, uh, from the medical field. Is that right? Yes. And so when we're thinking of a medical scaffold that might be used in the body, for example, uh, that could be made of materials that are not edible. Is that correct? Oftentimes it could be, but in general, my sense is that a lot of things you want to be really biocompatible in a way that maybe doesn't necessarily make things edible, but may in many contexts. 
I see. Okay. And then another thing I thought of is when you gave the example of celery, you know, celery stock being used as a scaffold, it made me think that you know, as more and more research and development funding is put into cultured meat technologies, would we potentially see players in the space that develop exclusively develop uh, empty scaffolds so then these clean meat or cultured meat companies can go out and, and fill these molds fill these scaffolds with their product is that something that we might see or is that maybe too high level i think that would be great so one interesting thing um, one interesting field is a real parallel i think in many ways to the cellular agriculture field is the field of tissue engineering for human applications for people who have lost muscle or who are looking for different kinds of tissue implants for a variety of reasons. And in that field particularly, there are a lot of small companies that fill these very specific niches, for instance, cell delivery or cell production. Rooster Bio is a company, for example, that does a lot of cell production. And so I think it's entirely possible that there could be companies in the future that just do cellular agriculture scaffolds, for instance. I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to the day, too, when we kind of get this enormous diversity in companies in cellular agriculture that fill these very specific niches. That's cool. Uh, this is pretty sci-fi, but imagine shopping on Amazon for a scaffold for like a ribeye steak. You, the scaffold comes to your home and you put it into like an integriculture home appliance and within four hours you have your ribeye steak. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's like the dream, right? It's definitely sounds like the Jetsons, but I guess we're not too far off. Hopefully not. So you mentioned, I think you said cellular agriculture for insects. Can you give me a very brief description on, on what that would be? Would that be, for example, cultured insect meat? Yeah, quite possibly. We have a student at Tufts University, Natalie Rubio, who just published on this topic end of last year. Uh, she works in Dr. David Kaplan's lab, and she's been doing a lot of work with different insect muscles and cell isolation procedures from them. So, yeah, basically the idea there is that insect cells have a lot of advantages over mammalian cells. I also did a bunch of insect cell work when I was in grad school for protein production. And the great thing about them is they can grow at this huge variety of temperatures, anything from pretty cold above freezing, but still pretty cold all the way up to quite warm, like warmer than um, mammalian cells can handle. So the, the span of temperatures that they can handle is great. The densities that they can grow to is also are also very high. So there are a lot of kind of cases where insect cells might be much, much easier and cheaper to grow than, say, other kinds of materials. The other kind of cool thing about insect cells is that in many cases, they don't need to be grown with fetal bovine serum to grow. So many mammalian cell cultures require this fraction of fetal cow blood to get a lot of their growth factors and nutrients. Uh, and insect cells are much more robust and in many cases don't need that. So that's one way to break free from the fetal bovine serum a little faster. That's cool. And I know that there's a lot of different applications when it comes to insects for food, for human-grade food. Uh, we had someone on the show that has a company called Chirps, and they produce chips and protein powders. And I think there's a lot of different things that you can do with, with insect protein. So it's, it's interesting to look at it from a cellular agriculture perspective. That's really cool. Yeah, I really think there's a lot of promise there. So let's get a little bit personal. Uh, for many in, in the field of cellular agriculture, uh, people are drawn from an animal welfare or environmental or a health perspective as to the reason why we should have uh, cultured meat. So what drew you to cellular agriculture? And tell us about when you first heard about New Harvest, actually. Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like Cellular agriculture is still such a small community in many senses that most people have interesting stories about how, how they found their way to new harvest or how they found their way to the kind of field of cellular agriculture in general. So for me, I was in my fifth year of grad school finishing up my PhD, and I knew I had a lot of skills in protein production. I knew I liked doing science. And I knew a lot of my kind of classmates were looking at careers in the kind of pharma space or um, a lot of the more traditional kind of biomedical careers. 
And I kind of thought, you know, that's a great space, but there's so many talented people going in there. I wonder if there's an area um, where I could use my kind of skills in protein biochemistry for something else. So I, I started thinking about food and thinking about kind of the synthetic biology space. And through going down the kind of internet rabbit hole of Googling, I came upon New Harvest. And uh, that's that's kind of uh, the the long and the short of it is um, after that, I was really hooked. I, I'm really driven by the science and by the technology involved. So I'm a real kind of, I'd say, techno-optimist and sustainability nut. So it's that's more the angle that brought me into this. I just think this is a really exciting thing that could make the world better. Cool. And for the the scientists and aspiring scientists that are listening, what are some of the best ways to get involved in the field of cellular agriculture? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of people kind of come to New Harvest either at career transition points or very early on in their science careers. And the advice I have for most of these individuals is pretty much the same. Um, the more bench work experience you can get, is the better, the more you can learn in a lab, the better. A lot of skills are translatable. And honestly, at, at first, it often doesn't matter what you're working on as long as you start learning how to ask the right questions and, and getting your feet wet. If you're interested in doing particularly cellular agriculture research, we find in general that bioengineering professors are often the most open, but we have professors in our network all the way from chemical engineers up to stem cell biologists. So there's quite a bit of variety. So. Um, oftentimes it's, it's nice to kind of tailor uh, your learning and your experience to your background so you can get a little farther a little faster. And once somebody has started on their path, what is the process of becoming a New Harvest Fellow? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I'm so happy when we have students reach out to us. So usually students start working in a lab, start realizing they enjoy that work and they're interested in pursuing graduate school. So the first step in the process really is to find an advisor that's interested in mentoring your project. So students need to reach out to different professors who have expertise in a variety of areas and find a good fit. That That's often the hardest part in the process because you need to find someone that is interested in working with you, is interested in doing cellular agriculture, and also has the ability to take on a grad student. So oftentimes what I tell people is to kind of reach out to professors and tell them, uh, you know, that you're interested in applying for a New Harvest Fellowship, and would they be interested in talking to you about, about that process and about joining their lab. So uh, that's really great because professors often like to have students that bring their own funding with them. And if they win a new harvest award, then they're uh, fully funded through us. So it's it's a nice way to kind of introduce the topic of cellular agriculture to professors in a context they understand. Finding an advisor, applying with that advisor with a proposal, is that the best general method, would you say? Yeah, yeah, that is in the, a nutshell the method. We have two deadlines a year, April 15th and November 15th. Um, and you can find out more information on our grants page on our website. Um, so people in general start that process and reach out to me for an application packet, and I'm happy to send those along so you can kind of get a sense for what our application is like. It's five to six pages of proposal, and it's a lot like a, an NSF graduate research fellowship. If students are kind of used to that kind of format, it's very similar. Um, so that's the basic kind of process for getting your application together. And uh, once you submit that application, we do a full external review and we do interviews with the student and the professors. So it takes a little bit of time to kind of get all that processed, but we try to get back to people as soon as possible with an answer. So we like to get research underway as fast as we can. Find an advisor. There are two deadlines every year. There's an application packet, and then you guys do a full review and conduct interviews. Yes, that's correct. Investors have been perking their ears up to scientific achievements in the space, and a lot of people are seeing cultured meat and cellular agriculture as a hot topic. So for the investors that are tuning in, what are some of the p potential business opportunities that you see might come as a result of some of these breakthroughs? Yeah, so you hinted at one of them earlier, which is I think some of these smaller, more niche type companies that fulfill specific cellular agriculture industry needs. Things like companies that make serum-free media formulations that are food grade rather than medical grade, for instance. Um, and therefore have lower costs for production. Things like um, companies that make scaffolds or companies that produce cells. 
So I think that's one step that's going to be really exciting is more of these niche companies that have direct focuses. Another, I think, exciting opportunity in this space is that uh, we're starting to see every now and then some interest from biopharma companies at entering the cellular agriculture space. And I'm really excited about that because a lot of the technology that they already have in-house is very applicable to cellular agriculture. It, it's much easier for them to innovate and to get into cellular agriculture much quicker than, than say, many companies in the food space that would need to build their entire research program up from scratch. I attended New Harvest 2018. Last year, there was this really amazing uh, talk from a professor, and uh, but they were kind of showing a leaf and and actually putting, I think they were putting blood through it, and it kind of showed, I think, a very similar example to what you were saying about using celery. Yeah, that's Dr. Glenn Gaudet's lab at Worcester Polytechnic. We're very excited. We're taking on a fellow in his group this coming year, so we're, we're very thrilled about that. Uh, he's, he's a great presenter, and he's doing some really exciting work. We have another presentation at this year's conference, too, if you're interested in plant-based scaffolds from a lab that does work on celery. So we're very excited about that as well. We also have a couple other fellows presenting that I've mentioned today. Our fellow, uh, Natalie Rubio, who's working on insect cell muscle culture, and our fellow Scott Allen, who's working on bioreactor development and kinetics. So we're very excited about those presentations. And we also, we try to keep it fresh. We try to keep it new. So there's a lot of stuff that maybe you wouldn't think necessarily fits into cellular agriculture, but it does because it's a parallel. For instance, we try to um, keep it a little bit different every year. So I think there will be some surprises on the schedule as well that will be a lot of fun. It's a great time at the conference, and we really enjoy having people there. Uh, it's also a great venue where it's MIT Media Lab. So it's a real kind of hub of technology and innovation. It's a really fun group of scientists, investors, students, uh, and interested parties. So definitely encourage everyone and anyone to come. So when exactly is the conference, and what is the best way to sign up? So the conference is July 19th and 20th at the MIT Media Lab in Cambridge, just outside of Boston. And the best way to sign up is go to our website, www.new-harvest.org, and go to the upper left-hand corner for our 2019 conference page, um, and you can sign right up there. So definitely please sign up and buy tickets before we run out. We're very excited about the event, and we think we're going to fill that venue. So um, please come and join us. We, we look forward to seeing you there. So you could learn more about Kate on LinkedIn and more about New Harvest and the New Harvest Conference at www.new-harvest.org. Uh, Kate, I'm going to ask you the second toughest question uh, for today. The first being, when will cultured beet be available and ready in stores? That's the million dollar question. Uh, but today I'm asking you the second toughest question, which is, are there any last insights that you might have for our listeners? I would say that there are always new bits of breaking news here and there in the New Harvest community that you can find out about on our newsletter. So if you can sign up on our website, that's also at new-harvest.org. I'd highly recommend doing so. Uh, there's a lot going on around here, and we'd love to share it with you. Kate, thank you so much for being with us today on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Of course. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. This is your host, Alex, and we look forward to being with you on our next episode.